Good day, and thanks for joining us for our Corn and Soybean Outlook webinar. Joining me is my colleague, Dr. Michael Langemeyer, who's the Associate Director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture and also a Professor of Ag Economics. And we're doing our webinar today primarily because USDA released two really important reports yesterday. They issued the September Crop Production Report, and then the World Board released its uh, World Ag Supply Demand Estimates uh, yesterday afternoon as well. So we're going to go through some of those numbers and talk a little bit about the implications for profitability for corn and soybean farmers here in the Corn Belt. So let's take a look at some of those numbers. These are the September 2019 corn production numbers from USDA. There was no change in acreage, and that was known beforehand. Uh, USDA will do some revisions to the acreage numbers later on, but on the September report, no additional information relative to what they had in August. So that was constant. But what they did come out with was their first objective yield estimate, where they actually send observers into the field um, and actually looking at uh, crops across the Midwest uh, and elsewhere in the country. Combining that with other information as well, they've been looking at satellite information, they've been uh, also conducting farmer surveys, so all that composite information used to generate the yield estimates. And their yield numbers did come down a little bit compared to a month ago. On the corn side, 168.2 um, bushels per acre, that's down a little less than 1% compared to the August numbers. And on the produ production number then, with the acreage held constant, we're also down just a little bit less than 1% at 13.8 billion bushels. And these acreage numbers could be adjusted, maybe adjusted again next month, and so it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, there's two more possible adjustments, I think, with respect to acreage. One would be next month, and then the other one would be uh, after the first of the year. And obviously, I think the thing that probably uh, people are thinking about the most now is what that harvested acreage yes. number is going to wind up being. Will we really hit the 82 yeah. million acres, yeah. or will we have some difficulties? And there's a lot of factors in there. The, the crop is behind. We're going we're to talk about that a little bit later in the webinar, and so that's a, certainly an issue. But also, uh, there's cer certainly a possibility that we're going to have more corn silage than normal, and, and that certainly would adjust that harvested acres, too. Yeah, so there's still some uncertainty on that side, not just on the yields, but also on the acreage, but that's going to get resolved a little bit later. Let's just take a look at where some of those yield changes came about. This is a chart from USDA that shows on a state-by-state -state basis the changes they made relative to the August forecast. So the states in red are where they made a reduction, uh, the states in blue where there was an increase, and then the gray uh, states that are shaded gray, there was no change relative to the uh, estimate that they released last month. And you can look at it and see in most of the states there was a small reduction. It was pretty uniform. There wasn't any individual state where there was a huge reduction. Um, at least not in the, among the major producing states. The two larger ones there, Jim, are, are Michigan and, and Indiana, and I don't think that's a real big surprise. A lot of late planting in those states and a lot of uncertainty uh, where those yields are gonna end up. And, and just a, 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 point, a point of reference here, looking at the Indiana yield 161, that's at least 14 to 15 bushels below the trend. Yeah, that's right. I think trend yield was in the mid-170s. So a lot of that was already known. I think a lot of us expected to see a reduction. The trade probably was looking for a little larger reduction in yields than, than what we saw in the report, but nevertheless, not too far off from, from expectations coming in. Uh, if you look at the aggregate numbers, I think it was interesting to look at this year's estimate for the corn crop at roughly 13.8 billion bushels. That's down 4% in, in round numbers uh, compared to a year ago. And it's actually uh, the third year in a row now that we've seen those corn production numbers come down. We topped out back in 2016 at just a little over 15.1 billion bushels, and now we're down to 13.8. So we have a little bit of a trend going here with reducing corn supplies. Uh, and of course, part of that was because soybeans were more profitable for a yes. period of time. We were shifting acreage away from corn towards soybeans. We'll talk a little bit more yes. about that later. And really, this, the, you know, looking at 18, 19, this is, prim this is primarily, if not exclusively, a yield impact. You know, the yield is substantially lower than 18, as we all know. And so that, that's what's causing our decline here in production. So if you look at the ending stocks released by uh, the World Board yesterday, uh, projected ending stocks at the end of the 19 marketing year, which of course would be next summer, uh, about 16% of usage down just fractionally compared to uh, the pro projection for the 18 crop that we just wrapped up at 17%. So a modest tightening. Um, if you think about it relative to a month ago, uh, maybe not quite the same change that people were expecting coming in, I think. So 
Um, not much of a change there. A little different story on the soybean side when you compare this month's report to last month. So we'll take a look at that in a minute. But, but certainly at 16%, that's, that's, that's far enough ab above a point where we expect to see a, a spike in corn prices. Yeah, I think that's a good way to, to look at it, Michael. You know, earlier this summer, back in June and maybe early part of July, um, there was talk in the marketplace about the possibility of getting ending stocks as a percentage of usage down in that 10 to 11, maybe 12% range. Uh, and that does not appear to be the case now with a larger than anticipated acreage at that point. Uh, and also, truthfully, probably stronger yields, at least as of today, uh, than, than a lot of us were expecting and, six or eight weeks ago. And we're going to show a chart here looking at corn futures price. Obviously, corn futures price were much, much higher you know, back before the August 12th crop report. So the wild card, or at least one of the wild cards, uh, continues to be what's taking place with respect to crop progress. And this is from Monday's uh, crop progress report that US released, USDA released Monday afternoon. And I put this together just to look at how far behind this crop continues to be. Um, the percentage of the corn crop in the dough stage, the average for this time of year, 97%. This year, we're at 89%. You start looking at some of the individual state breakdowns and you can see here in the eastern part of the Corn Belt is where we lag uh, the farthest behind with Indiana at 82 percent, Illinois at 88, uh, Ohio at 75 percent, Michigan at 69 percent, Wisconsin at 72. So that tells us, uh, when, and, you, and you look also at the dented stage uh, data, um, that tells us there's still some risk to this crop out there. Um, it's not in the bin yet, so the estimates could change and that's a little unusual. Normally when we get to the month of September, if you see some additional changes in yields, it's usually fairly modest. This year, that could be the case, but if we see a turn in the weather, that could change uh, more significantly than we've seen in most years in the past. Yeah, that, that's certainly the case. And I, I was a little surprised that the Iowa number for Dennett wasn't a little higher than that. I, I, had, a, I had the impression that the, uh, the Iowa crop was quite a, quite a ways ahead of the Indi Indiana crop and the Ohio crop. I mean, obviously it is, but but not not as far as I might, uh, you know, as far as I thought it was. Um, yeah, because you, you can tell that from the five-year average, it's 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 quite a ways by, uh, behind the five-year average too. Right. So with that five-year average at 77 percent, and this year's uh, average as of this Monday, uh, this past week was 55 percent. So clearly some risk there. Um, there have been a few forecasts floating around the trade that suggest that by late September we could see some cooler weather, and that'll probably uh, creates some more uncertainty, but uh, this crop's not out of the woods yet until we probably get yeah. into uh, perhaps the early to mid part of October. And I mentioned the corn side, something about corn silage early, early in, in during this webinar. And if you look at Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin, I think all of those three states in particular, there's some potential that some of that corn might be corn silage rather than corn for grain. We'll yeah. just have to have to watch it. Yeah, that's a good point. So still some uncertainty, even though we've got the yield estimates. I guess the way I would characterize the yield estimates, USDA assumes normal weather patterns uh, following uh, their yield estimate date, which on this one was September 1. Um, this is a year when we need normal weather all the way through mid-October. And so uh, I think one of, the, one of the points of concern in the trade is uh, many years we have at least a portion of the crops that's uh, susceptible to early frost. This year, I think we've got a significant portion of the country that needs at least the average frost date, or maybe even a touch later for this crop to really yeah. reach maturity. A week or two later would make a big difference. Yeah, yeah, so some uncertainty there. Uh, and I think from a lot of its perspective, the yield numbers USDA released this week are probably the upper bound of what yields could be. If there is some risk on yield, it's probably on the downside. Yeah. I think that's particularly true. We're gonna to get to the soybeans here. I think that's particularly true with regard to soybeans. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at the soybean numbers. So again, acreage didn't change relative to last month's report, no additional survey information to, to base a change on. Uh, the focus then is on the yields. And again, a little bit like corn, they reduced the yield numbers um, slightly more in percentage terms than they did on the corn side. So a little over 1% reduction on the, on the uh, yield side to 47.9 bushels per acre. That's down 1.2% compared to last month. Puts us 7% below where we were last year. And then on the production side, um, that puts production down about 1.3% this year versus a month earlier. But compared to a year ago, 
it's a 20% reduction. And of course, that's coming about not only because of the yield, but also the big reduction in soybean acreage compared to last year. Yeah, that's really striking. 20% down in one year. It's been a while since we've seen an adjustment like that. Yeah, we'll take a look at a chart that maybe helps us uh, clarify that a little bit in a minute. Let's take a look at the yields on a state level basis. The chart looks a lot like what we saw with the corn side uh, with respect to where we saw reductions and where we saw essentially no change. Um, maybe one of the changes that I noticed just looking at the chart very, very quickly was the fact that on the soybean side, we were down a little bit in Iowa compared to a month ago, whereas corn was a no change. But, uh, you know, as you look at it, um, probably not too many surprises there in, in terms of which states were down. Um, maybe Missouri coming up a bushel was a little bit of a surprise, but nevertheless, uh, fairly widespread uh, changes uh, distributed across the Corn Belt and the major producing states for soybeans. There's always differences in, in relative yields among the states, but it's particularly wide this year. I was looking at the Nebraska number a little, a little closer before the webinar. That's only one bushel down from last year, which was a record for Nebraska. And so if you go all the way from there uh, to Indiana, that's at 49, which is five bushel below the trend. And, and that number could go down, certainly. Uh, given where the, where the uh, you know, how far along the crop is. Then you look at Kentucky and Tennessee, record soybean yields. And so what a year of extremes when it comes to soybeans. And it really just a continuation of what we've seen all, late all growing season. Yeah, the late yeah. planting. Okay. So you mentioned earlier, it's been a while since we've seen a reduction in, in uh, soybean production of, of this magnitude. The reality is it's been a long time since we've seen a year-to-year -year decline in soybean production really has been uh, 2012 was the last year that we saw soybean production on a, on a total basis decline relative to the prior year. And so down 20% uh, this year versus last year, big decline, tightened stocks, and actually tightened stocks more than I think the trade was expecting uh, coming in. So I think that's been a very interesting yeah. fact. Go back to that chart, Jim, you know, just, to, just as a frame of reference here, that, that drop in seven, of course, was the start of the ethanol boom. And so we increased corn acreage dramatically in, in 2007 and dropped soybean acres for that one year just to, just to fuel the, the ethanol plants. Yeah, so let's take a look at the ending stock situation. I think this is uh, probably the surprise for most of us relative to where we thought we were gonna wind up last spring. When we were doing some of the webinars uh, last spring and, and late winter, uh, the idea that we would be able to pull the ending stocks for soybeans as a percentage of usage down all the way from the mid to upper 20s uh, down to 16% as the projection for the 19 crop at the moment. Um, that's, that was surprising, I think. And it was a little bit of a surprise to the trade relative to what people were expecting coming in. So part of that was on the yield side, part of it was also on the usage side. Uh, and of course, we've had some news this week with respect to China stepping in and, and buying some beans. So a tremendous amount of uncertainty on the demand side but we did get a little bit of a positive yeah. surprise. That's been been uh, tough to come by on the demand side lately. What's the chance of that coming down more? And what would be the factors that to look at if if, if uh, to, to to lower that uh, that ending stock percentage? Well, that, that's a good question. And so if you think back to corn, there's really two possibilities, right? One is yield, and the other one is the fact that the acreage, the harvested acreage, could wind yes. up being lower than what USDA is currently suggesting. On the soybean side. The risk is probably mostly on the yield side, not so much on the acreage side. So if you think about it, let's take a look at the crop condition numbers. Uh, this is a little less information, I guess, than what we have on the corn side. We'd really just have the setting pods, uh, and, and we're behind. You know, last year, a five-year average for setting pods at this point should be almost 100%. Um, this year, we're at 92%. And I think this is a case where it is instructive to look at some of those state numbers. If you look at, for example, uh, Indiana at 84 percent, Illinois at 90, um, it's almost unheard of to see that low of a percentage of the crop setting pods. Mid-September, you got 15, 16 percent of the soybeans haven't set pods yet. Yeah. yeah. So that's th those are pretty amazing numbers, and that just is an, you know, another indicator of how late this crop is, and also what that means with respect to the need for a continued um, good favorable growing season here for these last few weeks of September and truthfully the first probably the first couple weeks of October. Yeah. 
Our, our friend and colleague Chris Hurt sometimes talks sometimes talks about a window of opportunity with respect to trade with China. Uh, comment a little bit about, about that, Jim. I mean, if we did, we, if we got this resolved quickly, would that would that cause a, a major spurt in, in exports? Yeah, so I think one of the things to think about is when do we typically sell soybeans to China? And the answer is we sell soybeans to China when South America doesn't have much available. So the bulk of our soybean sales in the past that have gone to China have occurred in the fall quarter, spilling over into the very beginning of the winter. Uh, so the window of opportunity is now. And so I think if you think about whether or not you want to get optimistic about striking a trade deal with China and the impact that could have on soybean exports, for example, and ultimately soybean prices, it's important that that get resolved relatively soon so that we don't lose that opportunity to sell soybeans uh, to China here this fall. Uh, because if it happens in January or February, uh, it's probably not going to have anywhere near the positive impact that what it would have if we were able to settle it here in the next, say, the month or six weeks. And, and a couple of wild cards there. Even if, even if it's resolved, it takes a while for us to get back to normality. It's not something that happens overnight. All of a sudden, oh, but no, now China's going to export as many soybeans as they did a year or two ago. That just doesn't happen overnight. The other thing that we probably, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention is the African swine fever. That certainly reduced the, the demand for soybeans in China. And so, and so they, in, in some essence, they have more flexibility uh, with regard to who they buy soybeans from and how much they buy. Yeah, I think uh, one of the key things to think about with respect to soybeans in China um, is the fact that one of the major reasons why they were increasing their soybean purchases from us was to fuel their livestock mm -hmm. sector, and a big chunk of that was on the swine side. Um, a lot of uncertainty with respect to exactly what's happened to China's hog herd. Uh, government figures would suggest uh, reductions in the swine herd of less than 50%. There's a growing number of people in the trade, though, that think that the uh, Chinese hog herd might be down over 50% compared yeah. to where it was uh, roughly a year or so That's ago. That's unbelievable to be down 50% Yeah, it's, year. That, the reduction in their hog herd uh, likely exceeds the total hog herd in the U.S. So bottom line, even with a trade deal in place, or assuming we got one in place, um, it's not going to take soybean exports back to where it was uh, a year and a half or so ago before all this got started. Now, it's a question that I sometimes get when, I, when I'm talking about this issue is uh, uh, looking at other countries, you know, uh, other countries that might, that might buy U.S. soybeans or Brazilian soybeans or soybeans from Argentina. Uh, and the fact is, I mean, you, maybe you have more specific information on this. The fact is, is China is overwhelmingly uh, the largest importer of soybeans. It drops off dramatically after that. Uh, and so, and so, and so it, that's why we always talk about China is, is, is it's not that the rest of the world's unimportant, it's just that they're such a small player uh, when it comes to importing soybeans compared to China. Yeah, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is the fact that we have made some gains with respect to increasing exports to some other markets, that's the good news, but it has been dwarfed by the loss of exports to China. So. Uh, good news, we are making some headway. The bottom line, as you point out, it's really tough to make up for a customer that's as large as China yeah. was historically. Well, let's take a look at futures prices briefly. So this is a chart for December corn futures from this morning. And you can see there's been a modest rebound uh, since the report came out and actually started to rebound maybe several days before that. But not a huge change. I think if you look at where that chart bottomed out, just a little bit above 350. This morning we were trading at that 368, 369 range. So a modest improvement. Um, you know, if you're a, a chartist and really like to look at charts a lot, you'd probably think that that 390 is kind of an objective because there's a gap in the chart at that point. So a lot of people in the trade will be thinking about that. Uh, without some kind of a shock, though, it's probably going to be tough to push prices above that 390 level. At least that would be, I think, my bias. Do you agree with that, Michael? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. I, I was going to point out we're going to be talking about uh, uh, you know budget information for for 2020. I looked at the December 2020 corn futures uh, before the webinar, and that's trading closer to four dollars. And so certainly, and so, so it certainly looks like there might be some price strength uh, in 2020, and maybe an opportunity to start yes. doing some pricing for 2020. Let's take a look at a soybean price chart. And here it looks dramatically different, yes. truthfully, right? If you look at the soybean price action just this week, uh, we were trading down as low as almost 850. Um, here, relative to that, we're basically about a 50 cent move with soybeans uh, this morning trading in the ballpark of about $9. 
And again, if you're kind of a chart person and you kind of like to look at charts and use that as a way to project, um, notice that that would be about a 50% retracement from where we were back in uh, roughly uh, late June, uh, early July. We had prices in that 950 range for a short period of time. Uh, we're back to $9. A lot of chartists like to use that 50% retracement as kind of an objective. And so that might be an opportunity, depending on how optimistic you are about one trade and two, how pessimistic you are about yields as to whether or not you might want to do some pricing. Uh, and particularly this year with a lot of people, especially in the Eastern Corn Belt, the tremendous uncertainty about production levels. I think we had probably less forward pricing going on this year than we've had in some prior years. And so if you haven't done much, uh, this might be an opportunity to do a little bit of catch up on the 2019 crop. And we talked, we talked, uh, uh, talked about scenarios where the soybean price might be stronger. There's also scenarios where the soybean price might be a little weaker uh, than what's reflected here. Uh, you know, if we don't get an agreement with China, that lingers on and, and, uh, and, and they don't buy more soybeans that was announced recently. Uh, oh, maybe, the, maybe the acreage is slightly higher than what, than what uh, USDA is forecasting. Maybe the yield is going to be similar to where it's at or, not, or slightly higher. And so it's, not, it's a, non, a non-zero probability that the pro we could even see weakening of prices. Yeah. And so that makes this marketing, you know, developing a marketing plan even more important. Yeah. So I think looking at that rebound that we've had, that, that is a, if you haven't done anything in particular, um, this might be an opportunity to start uh, thinking about doing some pricing. Um, one of the things that's usually on people's minds at this point is to store or not to store. Uh, my first recommendation is take the time to think about what your on-farm storage costs are. Um, <clears throat> we penciled out some, some approximations here uh, this morning thinking about primarily the opportunity cost on the money you've got invested in either soybeans or corn. And so if you do that and then recognize that typically there is some cost associated even with on-farm storage that's already in place uh, and paid for, there's still some operational cost. So on the soybean side, probably about four to maybe as much as six cents a bushel per month is your cost. On the corn side, probably about two cents to maybe as much as four cents a bushel. That'd probably be a little on the high side for a lot of people, but still in that ballpark. Think about that, <clears throat> recognizing that storage is not free, I guess is the point we're really trying to get across here. And then the second thing is to think about what those, uh, those futures price spreads are uh, and what the basis bids and patterns are. And truthfully, this is gonna be a really tough year to forecast basis. Uh, and you can see that looking at, at some of the forward cash bids from some of the elevators, there's a lot of uncertainty. And that's corn and soybeans, both of them, both of yeah. them would be in that category. So I think relative to the past, we've probably got more basis variability ahead of us than, than what we typically expect to see. Um, if you're one of those people that has the opportunity to take advantage of early fall basis, early strong fall basis, I'd recommend doing that. And there's gonna be some people here, in, even in the Eastern Corn Belt, that for whatever reason, they were able to get the crop planted on a more timely basis, uh, and get it harvested, take advantage of a strong basis, I'd recommend doing that. Um, later on, uh, as we get in deeper into harvest, uh, particularly in the regions where the crop was planted later, um, if fall basis is very weak, that's gonna make storage a lot more attractive. So. This is a situation where you really need to pay attention. We typically talk about monitoring basis on a weekly basis, uh, you know, once a week, and that's still pretty good. This might be a year when you need to pay attention to basis almost every day. Uh, we saw that this summer. Basis was extraordinarily volatile this summer on a daily basis. Uh, I think that could be the case again this fall, particularly in this early fall, as we kind of transition away from kind of the tail end of the prior year's uh, crop marketing year into the new crop marketing year, there's gonna be some opportunities to take advantage of, and you're gonna watch that, wanna watch that very carefully. One of the things I wanted to point out that's related to this, this topic is, is the importance of, of, of monitoring quality or maintaining quality of the crop uh, if, you're, if you're gonna store, and, and that, that leads into the topic of drying grain. Uh, we recently put a couple publications by Iowa State on, the, on our website uh, related to, to drying grain costs. And, and, and so make sure uh, that you're storing, the, you're storing a, you know, the grain at the proper moisture and so you can maintain quality. It's going to be a little bit more challenging this year. Yeah, there's going to be some situations where it's going to be challenging to dry down that corn because it might not mature, uh, and, and or might not mature early enough to take advantage of warm weather, which typically mm -hmm. we get the opportunity to use that as a way to dry down corn. 
All right, let's take a look at some farm management implications here, Michael, and I'm gonna let you talk a little bit about this first one. The first one here is, look, is just looking at the relative importance of government payments and crop insurance to gross revenue. We'll show you what that looks like uh, looking at return over variable cost or contribution margin, uh, but it just shows out, begins to point out the importance of the market facilitation program payments in 18 and 19. Uh, that red bar really, really helps. Uh, when you're looking at those MFP payments in 18 and 19. Also 15, we had some pretty good MFP payments for, uh, or not MFP, but our county payments for corn. Uh, this is a corn soybean rotation, so keep that in mind. But I also wanted to point out, Jim, uh, that uh, that there's 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 likely to be a PLC payment uh, looking you know going into 19, 20, and 21. Uh, I've, I've I've used the uh, the draft tool that's on FarmDoc. Uh, the, Gar the Gardner Government Payment Calculator, and it appears like we might get a PLC payment, particularly for corn, uh, in, in 1920 and 21. And, and, uh, and right now, there's over 50% probability of, of getting a payment. Uh, of course, that's not all good news. That means corn dropped below 370. Uh, but, uh, but, but nevertheless, that's, that's important to, uh, to know. But that's the main thing I wanted to do here, is, is just show how important the safety net is in agriculture to gross revenue. And I think it's important to look at that chart and recognize that the 18 revenue was higher than 17, mostly because of government payments. Yeah. Um, if you look at 18 relative to 17, 16, and 15, it was better than any of those years. Yes. Again, the government payments were really the biggest difference yeah. there, uh, along with some relatively strong yields. And in fact, uh, that 18 bar is actually pretty darn close to what it was in 2014. So. Yeah. That was a huge difference, a uh, combination of strong yields last year and large government payments made things look a lot better than they would have otherwise, right? Yeah, and I was looking at the Illinois FBFM data uh, the other day for 18, and, and uh, capital purchases were up rather substantially uh, in 18, and so they uh, a lot of people saw this as an opportunity to maybe replace some equipment. Yeah. And so that was definitely the case, didn't it? And you can see that it was the first, first opportunity some people had since 14. And as you look at 19, again, that red bar, that red component of the yeah. bar is actually pretty large. Yeah. Uh, without a, that, 19 would be a pretty tough year. 19 is, is, is it's, it's very, very difficult to estimate 19. This is for the West Central Indiana, Indiana Case Farm because right now I've, I've built in about a 10% yield reduction. That may not be near big enough. Uh, that's why I'm not showing crop insurance. Uh, on this particular chart, if we get, if the yield reduction is larger than 10%, we're starting to uh, we're starting to uh, uh, see some a uh, green bar uh, for 19, and so 19 is, is very very difficult to estimate. Uh, but but uh, nevertheless, we have to have something for planning, and, and it looks like 19 is going to be down uh, from 18 rather substantially, uh, and it looks like 20 and 21 aren't going to be much better than 19. Yeah, and just put that in perspective. If you take the uh, MFP payments, assuming that we wind up making uh, all of the MFP payment, not just the one half that was made here recently. Uh, for the state of Indiana, that averaged across all 92 counties, I think 67.50 yes. per planted acres. Yes. Per planted acre. And of course, in some counties, that was uh, as high as I think $80. $80. Yeah. Um, in some counties, it was down in the yeah. 50s. Yeah. So there's some variability there. But in the main corn and soybean counties, it was uh, primarily in yeah. the 60s and 70s. So a significant amount of revenue there. Right, this just shows it from a return on variable cost standpoint, and so you can see how how you know how important those MFP payments again were were in 18 and 19. Uh, it shows you how important crop insurance was in 12 and 15, and 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 again we may be in a situation where uh, crop insurance kicks in in, in 19. Uh, but it also shows you that return on variable cost doesn't look like it's going to be very good for the next three years, and so uh, and so that's that's pretty important when you're when you're uh, uh, you know doing some planning. So let's step back a minute, Michael, and uh, define contribution margin. Okay, for well, our we might want to do that, yeah. eh? Yeah, that, that would help, I think. Okay, it's, it's essentially gross revenue, which would include uh, crop revenue, government payments, and crop insurance, and so that's what's in the gross revenue on the previous chart. And then, the, and then the, it, it, it subtracts all the variable costs, and so seed, fertilizer, chemicals, uh, fuel, repairs, interest on operating debt, crop insurance, general insurance. Uh, these kinds of things, and the the contribution margin has to be large enough uh, to cover any land costs, uh, but also machinery ownership costs, and also uh, family and operator labor. 
So those are the three costs that have to be subtracted from here. And so when you're looking at a contribution margin that's below 300, you're not going to you're not going to cover all the opportunity costs. That's been the case. That's been the case since 2014 uh, on this case farm, and it's, it's it looks like it might be the uh, continue to be the case for the, for the for the near term. Yeah. So to put that in perspective, that chart suggests we're going to see continued pressure. Yes. Um, on earnings, continued pressure on. We'll talk about this later, but continued pressure on the land values and continued pressure on cash flow rates. And and definitely not an environment where you're going to see a. a uh, see a spike in capital purchases. All right. So what we want to do next is is uh, we've 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 looked at this in our previous webinar. What we want to do here is look at some <coughs> look at some estimated contribution margin uh, based on some uh, uh, you know different prices. Uh, we're looking at three different price scenarios for corn and soybeans, and so let's explain these a little bit. Uh, first of all, we are using the University of Illinois iFarm price distribution tool, which is available to the public. Uh, I looked at the prices this morning, and we're looking at three different price scenarios. Uh, a low price scenario where there's a 25% probability of prices falling below, an equal chance uh, a probability, or this is kind of our best guess, if you will. That's what I would call that. And then a 25% probability of prices rising above. And so what this does, it gives you a band on what the possible futures prices uh, you know, uh, could be uh, for, for, for December. Uh, this is for the De December uh, 2019 contract. So corn ranging from three, 345 to 389, uh, soybeans 861 uh, to 931. And certainly uh, that 30 cent improvement in futures prices uh, yesterday uh, did, uh, you know, did a uh, did really help the, the soybean prices that we're showing here. So you took those prices then and used that to estimate some... To calculate contribution margins. Let's take a look at those. And so I know this is a busy slide. We've talked about this, this Jim, but what this shows is, is the contribution margin. Let's look at the middle column, focus on the middle column. 0% uh, yield reduction, 10% uh, yield reduction because of late planting, 20% yield reduction even later planting, and 30% yield reduction uh, because of really late planting, June 15th planting and the 30% yield reduction. Uh, and, and so what it shows you, uh, what it shows you there is if there's zero uh, yield, percent yield reduction, the price is good enough that you're looking at a very healthy contribution margin, even, even with the relatively low price. Uh, and, and so there is gonna be some people in Indiana and, and Illinois um, you know, despite the preventive planted acres and the late planting, that, that are going to be in that category that's going to have a, a pretty good uh, contribution margin. Uh, and then once the yield starts dropping, uh, that contribution uh, margin goes down. The numbers in red actually are on red on purpose. Uh, what that means is that crop insurance starts kicking in uh, when the numbers are in red. And so, uh, and so uh, uh, once crop insurance starts kicking in, as you get to the 20 and 30% yield reduction, you'll, you can see across the row that the contribution margin is the same. Price, in essence, really doesn't matter anymore because you have the safety net associated, associated, uh, associated with, uh, with the crop insurance. But, but the main thing I want to illustrate here is, is not to get into the weeds uh, so much on, the, on, the contra on how bad it might be or how good it might be. Uh, it's, it's just to simply illustrate is how variable uh, profitability is going to be, uh, you know, for different farms. I mean, you're going to have farms with a 0% yield reduction all the way down to the 30% yield reduction, uh, and that's a $120, $130 difference in the contribution margin. Yeah, big, a huge difference, and I think it's one that's going to be felt this winter. Uh, we did the same thing with, with soybeans, and uh, again, the numbers in red is when crop insurance kicks in. And one of the things I want to note here, uh, particularly for those that are going to take a little closer look at this slide uh, after the webinar, which will be a lot of the, the people, of course, Jim, um, is, is you, looking at the previous slide and comparing it to this slide, the contribution margins don't get as low for soybeans. Why is that? Did, I, did Langemeyer make a mistake in the computations? Well, I might have. Uh, but, but nevertheless, what, that, what that's showing is, is, is the, the, uh, the planting date for crop insurance is so much later for soybeans that you're not seeing a reduction in the revenue protection coverage uh, uh, for the 30% yield reduction like you did for corn. You plant corn June 15th, you take a big hit in terms of your, your revenue protection coverage level. It, it drops. Uh, whereas soybeans, even a 30% yield reduction, uh, you're only taking a 5% reduction in the revenue protection coverage, and so that contribution margin stays up. And so a way to summarize these last two slides, there's a bigger chance of hitting a home run with corn, 
That's always the case, uh, in Indiana anyway. Uh, but it seems like, it seems like the, the safety net's going to be more effective uh, for our soybeans. With one caveat, and that is you didn't extend your chart into to the 50, planting. 40, 50. Well, yeah, in, in, into yeah. July. And we yes, did have a, and we have some of that. We had a significant number of soybeans planted in Indiana in July this year. So yeah. um, there is yeah. some of that out there yes, as there well. Is. All right. So this next slide kind of addresses the question that we get all the time, which is what's going to happen to cash rents? Uh, and to some extent land values. So let's take a look at this. Yeah, this, this is my favorite slide. I, we present this a lot in, in our webinars. And, and, and what this is showing is it's showing the trends in cash rent. That's the line. Uh, 2014 was the peak for West Central Indiana and for other areas in Indiana for that matter. Uh, Iowa and Illinois actually peaked the year before, 2013. Um, and I believe Nebraska also peaked in 2013. Uh, but since then, we've come down about 15%, and it, it sits at 241 today. Uh, I've only got 2007 to 2019 on this chart, uh, and the bars are net return to land. And so this is not contribution margin like we've been showing in previous slides. We're taking the contribution margin, and we're subtracting machinery ownership and operator labor from that to get the net return to land so we can directly compare the bars to cash rent. But over a long period of time, uh, 1996 to 2019, you know, going back to the uh, Freedom to Farm bill where we had more flexibility to plant, and, and really the start of some of the GMO, uh, you know, some of the, the GMO technology, that's why I'm going back to 96 in my conversation here, the average net return to land was $200. And so we're below average right now, but the reason I mention that is if we return to the average, 2020, 2021, 2022, the cash rent's still relatively high compared to that. And so all this, all this is really showing is there's, there's certainly uh, some downward adjustment that could be made to cash rents if net return to land does not jump above $200 anytime soon. And all the previous uh, charts that I've, showed, uh, uh, I've shown here uh, sh uh, shows a, a net return to land that's below $200. And so if that scenario plays out, there's a lot of wild cards there, of course, but if that scenario plays out, uh, we certainly uh, uh, could see some uh, adjustment to cash rents in the next couple of years. So we get a lot of questions about cash rents and what direction they're going to take. And I think this chart's really instructive, if, particularly if you look at 2018. Um, notice that that blue bar got a lot closer to the black line in 2018. Uh, really, there was two things driving that, right? One was the strong yields that we had in most of the Corn Belt and obviously in West Central Indiana where this case farm is based. And then secondly, the MFP payments yeah. f filtered in there as well. And that the fact that that gap actually got better is what caused yes. those rents to go up in 18 yeah. uh, or uh, relative to 2017. And actually that kind of carried over to some extent into the 2019, right? Uh, Definitely. Am I looking at that correctly, Michael? Definitely. Yeah, there, there's usually, usually what's happened in the previous year is very important to the next year, but also kind of a longer term average is also important. But, that, but certainly the higher yields and the MFP payments help keep the cash rents uh, right around that 240. Uh, in, in 2019, uh, and, and so and so the real uh, the real uh, uh, elephant in the room here uh, is will there be MFP payments for 2020? Uh, my answer to that is probably the same as yours. Well, it just depends. Uh, if we're still in a trade dispute, there could be, uh, and that you know that certainly would help uh, keep the cash rents up. But I think even if there was MFP payments in 2020 of of, of fifty dollars, for example, I still think we're looking at some possible downward pressure in cash rent. It won't be as big uh, as, as, as much pressure, but I think we're still looking at, at some downward pressure. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that surprised some people is the fact that cash rents, looking at that chart, have been relatively sticky. You know, year 2016, we were at 241. 2019, we were also at 241. So there hasn't been, on an average basis, a lot of change there uh, over that time frame. We're down from the peak back in 2014, but nevertheless, not a lot of change over the last three or four years. And projecting out, unless something shakes loose that we're not currently anticipating, it looks like the margins are gonna be uh, put pr uh, 
continued pressure definitely. on cash rental rates and in turn probably on some farmland values as well. Yeah, definitely. And and I think uh, cash rents and, and land values will 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 follow will track each other very closely and so if, if you I'm, I'm not saying this is the exact percent, but if cash rents decline 5%, you'd see a similar decline in land values. And the reason I say that is I think I think interest rates right now are fairly neutral. They're relatively low historically, but it doesn't look like they're going to change very much, uh, and so that makes interest rates have a neutral impact on land, and so land's going to really closely follow cash rents, which follows net return to land. And, and that's a good point about interest rates, because that's really a little different from what we were expecting, for example, two years ago. Definitely. I was, uh, uh, as some people some people probably know, I, w I was Dr. Doom when it comes to land values a couple years ago. Uh, part of that did not materialize because in interest rates did not increase as much as we, as we thought they were going yeah. to. Yeah. Land values are very sensitive to changes in interest rates. Yes, extremely sensitive. And, you know, if you look at the long-term uh, improvement that we saw in land values, a good portion of that was attributable to a long-term decline yeah. in interest rates. Yeah. And so that's why we've been concerned about the possibility of seeing rates uptick, yeah. but that does not appear to be in the cards here over the next year. Yeah, just to put that in perspective a little bit, uh, from 2007 to, to 2014, or 2006 rather, to 2014, that was the big increase in cash rents and land values in Indiana. Uh, cash rents more than doubled and are close to doubled anyway, and but but land values increased two and a half to two and three quarter time, you know, as much uh, as what they were in 2006. So land values increased much faster uh, from that 2006 to 2014 period. That was because of low interest rates. And so that's why we were thinking, well, if interest rates go, go up, uh, we're going to see uh, uh, more, more, of that, more of that appreciation come out of land values. I've kind of taken that off the table because interest rates don't look like they're going to go up anytime soon. All right. That's the way it looks anyway at the moment. A lot of uncertainty on, yes. on the macroeconomic outlook, not yes. only in the U.S., but around the world. But nevertheless, it, it looks like the pressure is going to be on flat to down on down interest rates. All right, one last slide. You took a look at uh, the difference in earnings per acre for corn versus soybeans. And this is an interesting chart because of the way it swings for extended yeah. periods of time. Let's make sure we uh, everybody understands what we've got here. I've got, I've got earnings per acre. Uh, and it really wouldn't matter as contribution margin. You know, yeah, I could do that too. But here I've got earnings per acre, so all the costs are accounted for. Uh, you know, for corn minus soybeans, and so when that number is positive, that means corn was relatively more profitable. When the number is 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 uh, negative or red, uh, the red bars that means soybeans were more profitable. And so during that ethanol boom, which I usually define from 2007 to 2013, for the most part, corn was king. Uh, corn was more profitable. We saw large increases of acreage of corn uh, during that time period, and, and you can just see how big the difference was in 11, uh, 11 and 12, just huge uh, differences in profitability in favor of corn. That switched in 2013, 2014, and, and has, has favored soybeans all the way through 2018. Uh, look at 2017 and 2018, you know, over $100 more profitability in soybeans uh, compared to corn. So just unprecedented almost, uh, you know, uh, soybean profitability uh, relative to corn. That's all changed. Uh, and, and the main reason I show this, the main reason I'm showing this for 19 and 20, uh, along with the history, is I think some people think that corn is going to be immensely more profitable uh, than soybeans because of the, the relatively lower soybean price than we, uh, you know, compared to what we had in 17 and 18. Really, all that's happening is the, the profitability we had in soybeans has just been taken out. And so right now, the, the relative profitability looks very, very similar. And so, and so producers, when they're making 2020 decisions, really have to pay close attention, uh, you know, close attention to these relative prices because uh, it appears right now it's going to be a tough decision uh, whether to plant corn or soybeans. And then I hate to throw this wrench in here, but I'm going to anyway. Um, right now we have 14 million acres of, of prevent plant for corn and soybeans. The real question here is, it's not factored into this slide, what happens to that acreage? Does it go to corn? Does it go to two thirds if it goes to corn? That's all going to change this relative uh, profitability. And so, and so, uh, you know, corn versus soybean decisions, particularly in the Western Corn Belt, are going to be very difficult uh, in, in 2020. And, and so, at, start crunching the numbers. And looking at your chart, I mean, what that suggests to me here in, in uh, Indiana is that it favors the traditional 50 50 corn soybean Definitely. split. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And I thought we were going to move more towards the 50-50 this year, uh, but, but because of all the late planning and everything else that was going on, we didn't quite get there. 
uh, yeah. this year. But certainly that's what it looks like at uh, 2020. Is, uh, will happen in 2020. Yeah. All right, that kind of wraps up our webinar. So thanks for joining us. Um, you can download the slides from this video on our website. We'll have those up this afternoon. Um, and uh, keep an eye on for future webinars. I know we'll do another webinar. We're scheduled to do one in December. There's a pretty good chance we'll do one before uh, then as well. So keep an eye on the website and on your emails, and uh, we'll look forward to visiting with you again. On behalf of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, I'm Jim Mintert. Thanks for joining us.